Hello everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. Today we're going to be talking about the work of the late and eminent scientist Stephen J. Gould. Specifically, we'll be taking a look at his famous 1981 book called The Mismeasure of Man, about race, IQ, and skull size measurements. During my own university studies, I had this text assigned in a class once or twice, and on each occasion it was always treated as if it were the Holy Gospel, as if there were nothing questionable in the book whatsoever. That is, despite the fact that certain studies had been done even before I was in that drew into question many of the things that Gould had asserted in his book. Gould has always been one of my favorite scientists, that's why I was so disappointed when I found out some of the things that I'm going to tell you about today. So we'll begin by looking at an article from The Guardian that sort of typifies the standard interpretation of the book and the way that the public is to receive Gould's work. I'll also ask you to pay close attention to the dates of each of these articles. So this one is by Tim Radford from November of 2009. Race and Intelligence, A Sorry Tale of Shoddy Science. The Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould exposes the shameful history of research into race and IQ. So it begins here. Earlier this year, Glenn Beck, the U.S. Fox News commentator, called President Barack Obama, quote, a racist with a, quote, deep-seated hatred for white people and white culture. Of course, that is despite the fact that Obama himself is half white, but also you have to remember that in 2009, the left was in complete total hysteria about the popularity of Glenn Beck, who has since been tossed out by people on the right as well. Uh, basically, no conservatives have any use for him anymore, more or less. Continuing, the subtext of the statement seemed to be that it is justified to be fearful and suspicious of people of another race if they hate and fear you. Well, isn't it justified to be rather fearful or suspicious of anybody who hates and fears you? That's kind of uh, strange, right? Or possibly is it just more than the usually uh, sanctimonious form of racism? But for me, it was also the spur to take a closer look at a book that charts the way American and European scientists have handled the debate about race, culture, intelligence, and economic and political success. Now, I have absolutely no idea what the connection there, there is uh, between what Beck said and something to do with Obama and then what that has to do with Stephen Jay Gould's book, but that spurned this article. And once again, I ask you for this next paragraph to pay attention to the dates. He says here, That book is Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure of Man, which seemed groundbreaking when it first appeared in 1981. It still seemed pretty good when Gould revised and expanded it in 1996. Now, one of the things we're going to get to later is that by 1996, a number of questions had already been raised about Gould's work, and none of this was being acknowledged in the revised and expanded version. Two years after two academic researchers, these would be Herrnstein and Charles Murray, published The Bell Curve, a book claiming to show that some hereditary lineages are innately less intelligent than others, leaving readers to draw the implication that money spent on educating them might be wasted. I'm not sure that is exactly what was being said at all. I don't think anybody was saying that uh, certain groups of people should never be educated. That's rather absurd. You can guess which lineages the authors might have included in this subset. Well, to me, that right there typifies the racism of the uh, political left. You always get this sort of, uh, you know, sort of they're on their high horse and they condemn racism, but then they always have this weird implicit racism that uh, sort of is uh, the subtext of all of their conversation about race as well. So he says here, what Gould's book reminds us over and over again is that even very clever, generous, and thoughtful people who are raised with a set of ingrained assumptions are likely to find evidence to support those assumptions. I'm going to skip the next section here. The great 19th century scientists Cuvier, Humboldt, Lyell, and Darwin, these are the people who founded uh, various aspects of geology and, of course, biology, uh, Darwinian evolution, all said things that betrayed an unquestioning belief in innate Caucasian superiority. I'm glad here that he actually lumps Darwin in with this because most Darwinists don't like to uh, be forced to admit that Darwin said some rather egregious things, not so much in um, Origin of Species, but in The Descent of Man. Go check that one out, The Descent of Man, and read what Darwin had to say about the various races. Their successors set out to confirm this belief. Louis Agassiz, a great 19th century scientist now in the U.S. Hall of Fame, thought 
uh, social equality between black and white a, quote, practical impossibility, and intermarriage, quote, a perversion of every natural sentiment, uh, end quote. Some 19th century biologists argued that black people were the product of a separate creation. Yes, the, these, they had a number of these uh, theories back during that time. These were usually called pre-Adamite theories. Sometimes they were called Hamitic or Chamitic theories about how the various groups came out of uh, the groupings that were mentioned in the Bible or you know, descendants of uh, you know, various biblical figures, but also the possibility that... Um, before Adam existed, there were these other groups that already existed because how else did uh, Cain go out and mate and reproduce if it wasn't with some sort of pre-existent group of people? Again, I'll skip down a bit here. He says, The idea that intellect had something to do with cranial capacity was, and to some people still is, an attractive one. And generations of researchers tried to find new ways to measure brain size and shape and match it with apparent intellectual performance. These experiments tended to prove that white people were cleverer than black people because they were bigger brained. Now, this is a very strange uh, paragraph here, and also the history of it within the scientific field is also very strange because you have the phenomenon that there is supposedly approximately a 0.6 to 0.8 correlation with brain size and IQ. However, we also know that Neanderthal had a larger brain capacity than Homo sapiens sapiens, but also was not considered to be as intelligent as sapiens. So this is a very weird phenomenon. Also, certain individuals suffering from what is called hydrocephaly have significant amounts of water in their brain. It literally means waterhead. And this uh, water brain uh, thing also, uh, you know, does not always diminish every single person to where they're completely incapacitated or disabled from functioning in society, though they do have a measurable, measurably smaller brains. Even with a larger cranial capacity, their brain is smaller. But even that does not always correlate directly with IQ. He continues here. In the mismeasure of man, Gould revealed that they could only prove this by massaging the results, cooking the data, and eliminating the unwelcome findings. One researcher found that German brains on average weighed 100 grams more than French brains. He was, of course, German. Measurements also produced inconsistencies. Some Caucasian geniuses had very big brains, and other intellectual giants had a very modest cranial capacity. So the anthropologist, anatomist, and pioneer psychologist started looking for other things. They tried to grade the intellectual status of men, apes, and women, Nordic, Slavic, and Mediterranean races, of long-headed and broad-headed peoples. And if you go back in the literature, what you'll find there designating that is the terms brachycephalic and dolichocephalic. They graded them according to the average dist distance between penis and navel, on the closeness of their eyes, on the lowness of their foreheads. This is also known as anthropometry, for those who don't know. And just a little more from this article here. He says, This book should make any sensible person wary of attaching too much value to IQ tests. There's some glorious stuff on the quixotic allotment of IQ ratings, and should make anybody very suspicious of statements about, quote, group IQ or the presumption that some races are innately more clever than others. If we all got it so shockingly wrong 150 and 100 years ago and even 50 years ago, then why have we got it right now? But there is another deeper lesson in this book. The people who debased the science of humankind rub shoulders with the people who successfully shaped the rest of modern science, from Faraday to Einstein and Dirac, from Thomas Henry Huxley to Watson and Crick. Oh my goodness, if only he could see what's going on today in relation to both uh, Watson and Crick and their numerous controversies. Then we move from that to something I was able to find from January of 1995 from Scott Morrison of Concordia University called A Review and Critique of Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure of Man, where he draws out a number of problems that were apparent even to him then as a uh, master's candidate um, in 1995 uh, with the book that Gould had produced. And I'll move over to page six of it so that we can get into the real meat of the conclusions about this that this person was able to find back then. He says, 
The weakness of Gould's criticism, however, is that without the rhetoric that he employs, Gould's book becomes a historical account of the misuse of statistics throughout the last 150 years, which only tenuously demonstrates biases in social science rather than strong attacks against these biases and scientific racism. Now, this is the thing that I'm going to break apart as we move further, is that what Gould claimed were misuse of statistics is actually wrong, and it's Gould who was the one who misused these statistics. So we continue here. Gould's arguments against biological determinism do not depend so much on the methodological errors of certain scientists, but on the rhetoric he can direct against these scientists. Unfortunately, if the rhetoric does not sway the reader, Gould's conclusions will have little or inconsequential impact. The main reason for illustrating Gould's rhetorical language and argumentation style is not to discredit Gould. His conclusions are agreeable, but they are not conclusive in that not all biological determinists and racists can be similarly countered. Racist intentions, as undesirable as they may be, will not always lead to massaged data and analyses. In other, why, in, other words, in other words, what he's saying here is that the data and analyses may actually back up certain of the claims of these racialist and hereditarian type thinkers that he's referring to. So for as much as I criticize them, I have to actually compliment uh, what good work goes into this New York Times article from June of 2011 by Nicholas Wade. The title is, Scientists Measure the Accuracy of a Racism Claim. Scientists have often been accused of letting their ideology influence their results. And one of the most famous cases of the, is that of Morton's Skulls, the global collection amassed by the 19th century physical anthropologist Samuel George Morton. In a 1981 book, The Mismeasure of Man, the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould asserted that Morton, believing that brain size was a measure of intelligence, had subconsciously manipulated the brain volumes of European, Asian, and African skulls to favor his bias that Europeans had larger brains and Africans smaller ones. But now physical anthropologists at the University of Pennsylvania, which owns Morton's collection, have remeasured the skulls, and in an article that does little to burnish Dr. Gould's reputation as a scholar, they conclude that almost every detail of his analysis is wrong. And among the other things they found in there is that Gould never actually personally remeasured any of these. He simply uh, engaged in recalculations that fit his own personal biases. It says here, I continue the article, I quote, Our results resolve this historical controversy, demonstrating that Morton did not manipulate his data to support his preconceptions, contra Gould, they write in the current PLOS, or PLOS, biology. Dr. Gould, who died in 2002, based his attack on the premise that Morton believed that brain size was correlated with intelligence, but there is no evidence that Morton believed this or was trying to prove it, said Jason Lewis, the leader of the team investigating it. I continue here. In his book, Dr. Gould contended that Morton's results were, quote, a patchwork of fudging and finagling in the clear interest of controlling a priori convictions. This fudging was not deliberate, Dr. Gould said, but rather an instance of unconscious doctoring of data, a practice he believed was, quote, rampant, endemic, and unavoidable in science. His finding is widely cited as an instance of scientific bias and fallibility. So as the Penn team began to investigate this, what they ended up finding is that in only 2% of cases did Morton's measurements actually differ significantly from their own. These er errors either were random or gave a larger than accurate volume to African skulls, the reverse of the bias that Dr. Gould had imputed to Morton. So I'll skip down a bit here so we can get into more of this. It says, Dr. Gould did not measure any of the skulls himself, but merely did a paper reanalysis of Morton's results. He accused Morton of various subterfuges, like leaving out subgroups to manipulate a group's overall score. When these errors were corrected, Dr. Gould said there are no differences to speak of among Morton's races. This is, of course, absurd to anybody who knows what the uh, data is since this time. But Dr. Gould himself omitted subgroups in his own reanalysis and made various errors in his calculations. When these are corrected, the differences between the racial categories recognized by Morton are as he assigned them. Ironically, Gould's own analysis of Morton is likely the stronger example of a bias influencing results. And uh, this is just uh, sort of a warning about uh, Nassim Taleb's book that he's working on about IQ and psychometrics and all of this. I would guess he may end up committing some of the same errors that Gould committed in his mismeasure of man. This is just a, a speculative guess. Now follow this final aspect here closely. This is really important. 
An earlier study by John S. Michael, then an undergraduate at McAllister College in St. Paul, concluded that Morton's results were reasonably accurate with no clear sign of manipulation. But when others suggested Dr. Gould had been refuted, Philip Kitcher, a philosopher of science at Columbia University, uh, you know, the birthplace of Boazian anthropology where, um, you know, this whole thing of uh, no cultures are better than any others, cultural relativism and all this stuff was born, rode to Gould's defense. He said here, it is not entirely evident that one should prefer the measurements of an undergraduate to, to those of a professional paleontologist, he wrote in 2004. Pending further measurement of the skulls and further analysis of the data, it seems best to let this grubby affair rest in a footnote. So he claimed there that a professional paleontologist should be listened to and not undergraduates, even though the professional paleontologist never even actually measured the skulls himself. He only reanalyzed them on paper. This is exactly how deception takes place in science today, folks. Dr. Kitcher said last week, when confronted with the data from the Penn team, he said that they had done a very careful job, and it's a nice thing that undergraduate work gets vindicated. So, in other words, he got slapped back in the face about uh, how absurd his earlier claims were. And we continue here. Ralph Holloway, an expert on human evolution, also at Columbia, and a co-author of the new study, was less than willing to give Dr. Gould the benefit of the doubt. He said, quote, I just did not trust Gould. I had the feeling that his ideological stance was supreme. When the 1996 version of The Mismeasure of Man came and he never even bothered to mention Michael's previous study, I just felt that he was a charlatan. And then as they did the reanalysis, they indeed found out that he was a charlatan and a liar and a deceiver. And if you find those rather harsh terms, you should listen to what Dr. Robert Trivers, author of The Folly of Fools, said in Psychology Today in an article called Fraud in the Imputation of Fraud, The Mismeasure of Stephen J. Gould, October of 2012. He begins here, Many of us theoretical biologists who knew Stephen J. Gould personally thought he was something of an intellectual fraud because he had a talent for coining terms that promised more than they could deliver, while claiming is got exactly the opposite. One example should suffice, the notion of punctuated equilibria, which simply asserted that rates of morphological evolution are not constant but varied over time, often with periods of long stasis interspersed with periods of rapid change. All of this is well known from the time of Darwin. The classic, the classic example were bats. They apparently evolved very quickly from small non-flying mammals, perhaps less than 20 million years ago, but then stayed relatively unchanged once they reached the bat phenotype we are all familiar with today about 50 million years ago. Nothing very surprising here. Intermediate forms were apt to be neither very good classic mammals nor good flying ones either, so natural selection pushed them rapidly through the relevant evolutionary space. And this is uh, because there are so many holes in the fossil record. That's essentially one of the reasons why Gould and Eldridge his uh, co-worker came up with the theory of punctuated equilibria because you don't have uh, very many preserved examples of macroevolutionary changes in the fossil record. So he continues here, but Steve wanted to turn this into something grander, a justification for replacing natural selection, favoring individual reproductive success with something called species selection. Since one could easily imagine that there was rapid turnover of species during periods of intense selection and morphological change, one might expect species selection to be more intense while during the rest of the equilibrium stabilizing selection could rule throughout. And I'll uh, move on here to the next paragraph uh, rather than going into all this guy's complaints about uh, Gould's work on punctuated equilibrium, which is interesting in its own right, and I'll link it below so you can check it out. Recently, something brand new has emerged about Steve that is astonishing. In his own empirical work attacking others for biased data analyses in the service of political ideology, it is he who is guilty of bias in service of political ideology. Jason Lewis and colleagues, 2011. What is worse and more shocking is that Steve's errors are very extensive and the bias is very serious. A careful reanalysis shows that his target is unblemished while his own attack is biased in all the ways that Gould had attributed to his victim. His most celebrated book starts with a takedown of Samuel George Morton, The Mismeasure of Man, 1981. Morton was a scientist in the early 19th century who devoted himself to measuring the human cranium, especially the volume inside, a rough estimate of the size of the enclosed brain. He did so meticulously by pouring first seeds in 
and then ball bearings into skulls until they were full and then pouring them out and measuring them. He was a pure empiricist. He knew brain size was an important variable, but very little about the details. Indeed, we do not know much more about it today. He thought his data would bear on whether we were one species or several, but in any case, he was busy creating a vast trove of true and useful facts. And uh, this is called uh, the controversy between the monogenist and the polygenists. And throughout the article, he goes on here into more detail about how Steve uh, really manipulated his data. He eliminated certain groups intentionally because they gave results that he didn't like. And he concludes here, Morton is made to look careless and incorrect when it is really Steve who is arbitrarily biasing things in his own favor. And I think this is a particularly powerful paragraph here as he says, there is an additional contrast between Morton and Gould worth noting. To conjure up Morton's mistakes, Gould lovingly describes the action of unconscious bias at work. Quote, Morton, measuring by seed, picks up a threateningly large black skull, fills it lightly, and gives a few desultory shakes. Next, he takes a distressingly small Caucasian skull, shakes hard, and pushes mightily at the foreman magnum with his thumb. It is easily done without conscious motivation. Expectation is a powerful guide to action. Indeed it is, but careful remeasures show that Morton never made this particular mistake. Only three skulls were mismeasured by being larger than they were, and these were all either Amer Indian or African skulls. The same cannot be said of Gould. He came across distressingly objective data of Morton, and by introducing biased procedures, no sample sizes below four, he was able to get appropriately biased results. And by misrepresenting the frequency of Nordic versus Amerindian subpopulations, he was able to create an illusion of bias where none really existed by mere emphatic assertion. No one even bothered to check. And this is one of the things that you'll continually notice about leftists is what they do is they, they repeatedly insist on things without conclusive proof, but then they pretend that that then makes that reality. Whatever it is that they insist upon over and over and over and over just simply is to be taken as true and unquestionable. And the article gets even better here on page three, as he says, in response to the criticism of Lewis and so on, the keeper of Gould's tomb, his longtime editor at Natural History, Richard Milner, had some choice comments in defense of Gould. Gould acted, quote, with complete conviction and integrity, that is, with full self-deception, he says. He was a tireless crusader against racism in any form. In what way is misrepresenting the true facts about population differences and then hiding this misrepresentation a contribution to anti-racism? And then, fully in flight, he says that any bias was, quote, on the side of the angels. Who of us is in any position to say what is on the side of the angels? We barely know what is in our own self-interests. And uh, I'll go ahead and link this article below. And the final one, which we're not going to take a look at, is sort of a, a defense of uh, Gould's ideology, basically trying to defend him as a person and as a scientist and so on. I'll go ahead and link that below if you want to check it out as well. It was also in PLOS -PL or PLOS Biology. It's called Morton, Gould, and Bias, a Comment on the Mismeasure of Science by Michael we uh, Weisberg. And uh, let's see, that came out in 2016. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.